The First Decade and the Crisis of the 1790s, Part 2. So where we left off um, was the actual development of two parties, the unwelcome and surprising development of two parties. Again, it's, it's funny that Americans really thought that parties were only something that Europeans did. You know, the French, the English, that was what corrupt people did. We're better than that. We're enlightened. We're above that. We're going we're gonna, to gonna make all the right decisions. We're on the same page. And then, of course, they realize almost immediately after the Constitution and the election of 1788 that they have very different opinions and, and they're going to have to learn to get along. Now, at the time, there was real fear that we were about to fall apart. And to be fair, I mean, as we're finally going to get into, uh, yeah, the 1790s were pretty rough and, and we barely hung on. I used an example of a marriage, uh, the breakup of a marriage to describe the revolution. In some ways, the 1790s is like the beginning of a marriage. Um, you know, and, and again, if, if you ever talk to anybody who's been married, and, and I can say from personal experience, the first year or so, you know, it, there's some wonderful things about it and it is exciting. But yeah, it's rough. It, it, it's it's real life. You gotta, you're learning how to blend your families and blending traditions and and you, you have to give up some of the things that you've always done. You know, like in my case, I, I, I was an only kid. I lived on my own throughout my 20s. Yeah, you have to get used to there's this other person that uh, doesn't go home <laughs> and you don't get to go home. You're, you're both at home and you have you do have different opinions. And, and of course, what happens is after a couple of years, you 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 develop your own traditions and, you know, and, and of course, everybody thinks it's all it's all just romance. But, you know, they're it's not romance all the time. And, you know, sometimes you wake up, you're in a bad mood or they're in a bad mood and you've got to figure it out. And you do. Uh, and that's kind of America in the 1790s. We were, you know, freedom is, as I say all the time, freedom is hard. Democracy is tough. And it's tough because you have to tolerate <laughs> other opinions and hopefully they'll tolerate yours too. And you have to learn, if you will, the language of democracy. And it took us, a, you know, it took us a while to, to learn that language. And so, uh, again, you know, with Jefferson and Hamilton, uh, it was genuinely seen as a true crisis for the people back then. And just a quick reminder, I stole this slide from somebody online. So I know it looks a little different than the slide you saw earlier, but it basically says the same thing. I just like the visual. I thought it looks better than mine. Uh, but just a quick reminder, uh, Hamilton uh, for the Federalists, and, and that also included Adams, technically included Washington, although Washington's not usually listed as a Federalist. Washington was just kind of Washington. He was almost, he was like the one guy that, uh, he was just, he was just who he was. And um, it's funny, like when Jefferson and Madison would complain about the Federalists, they almost never would mention Washington because they loved Washington. But Washington was a Federalist, too, for, for, for all intents and purposes, even though he didn't play these games. Um, but, you know, they believed in a strong government. We're, we're about to get into the idea of a, of a central bank, uh, protective tariffs. And, of course, that's basically a tax on uh import so that as things are coming over from england for instance you would put a tariff on them a tax so that it would make people not buy those goods and instead buy american goods we still do this today um they wanted a strong military which at that point was basically a navy um you get favor business favor trade um, it did tend to be much more of a northern party at this point. I mean, because that's where all the big cities were and all the ports and all the, not so much factories, but that, that's where that kind of industry was happening. And, you know, their argument was the Constitution was uh, a guide for government, but that it wasn't completely a limit on government. In other words, uh, a loose interpretation of the Constitution would mean if you came to my class and you had a... Uh, an energy drink and i said you're not allowed to have an energy drink in my class you would say it doesn't say i can't have it on the syllabus in other words that would be it, you know as long as it specifically doesn't say i can't do it then i can do it that's a loose interpretation uh, jefferson and madison thought no we don't want a big government so we want that constitution to be a true limit on government so government the federal government can only do specifically what the constitution tells them to do now what's funny is that when jefferson and then later madison become president 
they're going to act like federalists. And we'll, we'll get into that later. But, you know, but at this point, they definitely want a weak central government again until they're in charge. Then they'll want a strong. And that's always the case. I mean, even today, uh, Democrats will say we don't the Republicans should be allowed to do this until they're in charge and vice versa. So um, they wanted the economy to be run by the states. They wanted the military to be at the militia level, not at the national military level. And again, the focus on small town, regular people, democracy for farmers, not big city interests. This is one of the political cartoons. This is a little bit later. But basically showing this idea of you know parties pulling the nation apart. You have democracy, republicanism, federalism, you know, these pillars that kind of hold us together and it's the parties pull us apart. And you have uh, George Washington, um, almost like a god, literally kind of looking down. And what he says, I left you with a precious casket of choicest blessings supported by three pillars. Desist, my sons, from pulling at them. Should you destroy, uh, which you should remove one, you destroy the whole. You know, and this is really kind of the criticism of political parties. And it's very typical of how everybody felt. Of course, just like today, you know, Republicans will say Democrats are ruining everything. And Democrats will say Republicans are ruining everything, you know. Um, but, but this was a real fear. And, you know, the, the classic quote you always hear is John Adams. Um, John Adams, a Federalist who was vice president, said, you know, there's nothing I fear so much as the development of two powerful parties. You know, this was seen as a uh, complete black backsliding into the worst of English behavior. Now, Jefferson, and I'll explain why I have this photo here. Uh, Jefferson and Hamilton, again, really did hate each other. And I don't use that word lightly. They, you know, they were the extremes, if you will, of the two parties. And then everybody else would be a little bit more in the middle. But they had to work this out. And as I said in part one, at one point, uh, they were bickering so much in a cabinet meeting that Washington, you know, just as, you know, an old soldier, a person that, that you know, wasn't into political niceties, just grabbed both of them and threw them up against the wall and basically said, you guys need to work this out, you know. And so they did. Jefferson invited Hamilton to his apartment, you know, his room in New York um, to have a conversation about how can they work this out. And a few years ago, I, I used to take students to New York. Uh, I used to do a program called the Model UN, very active lately. And... Um, I, I took some students to New York, uh, I think 2012, and a couple of them were history majors. So we, I, you know, this is this meeting is hugely important. So I, I said, let's find where it was. And unfortunately, the building itself is long gone. It's just a, a, a big office building today. But there is a plaque. This is one of my students who went on to actually get into graduate school for history. Um, and you can't see it very well, but it just basically says this is where Jefferson lived. Uh, on Maiden Lane, and this again was just a couple of blocks away from where the inauguration was and where the president would have lived in New York. And at that building, in that apartment, if you will, the, sometimes it's known as the dinner table bargain. It's also known as the 1790 Compromise. Um, but basically, Jefferson, Secretary of State, and again, by the way, if you don't know what that is, it's Secretary of State's really the second most powerful person in the government, just below the president. Everybody always says vice president. Maybe today under Donald Trump, Mike Pence seems to have some real power. But generally speaking, um, Secretary of State is really the kind of the second number two person. Uh, that's the person that will that deals with other countries and deals with war. And in the early days of the United States, almost always the Secretary of State would go on to be president. So, uh, so he's, you know, again, so he's way up in the, in, in the cabinet. And then Hamilton, of course, was secretary of the treasurer. He was the money guy. And they decided to meet over dinner and they invited James Madison, you know, who they both knew. James Madison at this point worked for Jefferson. Of course, he wrote the Constitution. He would later be Jefferson's secretary of state and then will be the next president. Anyway, they all three met at Jefferson's home and had dinner. What's really interesting is that... Uh, we know exactly what they said because all three of them had diaries and, and they wrote afterwards exactly what they said. They also wrote letters to people and they all match up. So we have a pretty good 
idea of the conversation and being a nerd i always thought that would make a cool movie or cool play just literally that conversation anyway the main thing they were arguing um and it, it was where is the u.s capital going to be um you know it's 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 you know again it was in new york and, and you know but after that you know that was temporary where is it going to be and then how is america going to pay off all of this money that it owed and it owed millions of dollars to uh, other countries to banks and you know so how are we going to do this and they managed to work something out so first off uh the capital um jefferson who very much feared a, a strong centralized government at the same time he was even more interested in where is this capital going to be um, he wants it in the south and again one of the reasons he wants this is uh, again as, as i said in part one if you're near the capital you get more play you get more notice um, and again almost everything had been happening in the north at this point um, and Jefferson wants it in the South, especially in particular Virginia, which you know, was the first colony. It was the biggest state. Um, it, it is funny, you know, it, I, I, as a little kid, lived in Virginia. And Virginia does, even today, uh, still thinks of itself as being really important. Uh, you know, it's funny, if you do Florida history, it's local history. But if you do Virginia history, oh, that's national history. Um, but there's another reason he wants it beyond the fact that he's a proud Virginian and he wants focus on the South. Uh, he, again, and also there's less cities in the South, the idea that, that there'll be less Federalist influence. But this also has to do with slavery. And in fact, from this point on, almost everything in this class is going to at some point go back to slavery. You know, slavery was still a major institution. In fact, it's about to explode in the 1790s. Remember uh, Mulberry Grove and that guy, uh, 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 Eli Whitney? Yeah, his invention is going to lead to an explosion of slavery. And Jefferson already knows that there is a movement against slavery. Many slave owners have gotten rid of their slaves during the revolution. Uh, Washington eventually is going to free his slaves. Um, most of the northern states have outlawed slavery. So he knows that uh, this is on the table and so he wants that capital firmly in the slave area because if it's near slaves congress is going to be less willing to get rid of slaves and he knows this so that's so there there's also that element um so the this is sort of the draft that eventually makes it to congress because it does have to get passed by congress it becomes known as the residence act of for the moment that they're, they're going to go ahead and because everybody wants to be back in philadelphia so they're going to shift the capital to philadelphia for the next 10 years and i've already shown you you know the buildings in philadelphia where they were but they're going to construct a federal district the argument is it's not going to be in any one state um it's going to be sort of in this uh again a district so that there is no set um state getting any benefit and the name will be Federal City. Now, it was going to be finally constructed in 1799. And at the same time that they were moving the government to uh, Federal City, Washington died. Uh, you know, he served two terms. He went back home to Mount Vernon and he dies. And so they named Federal City in his honor, Washington. And the district in which Federal City sits is the District of Columbia, named for Christopher Columbus. Um, and again, we, we just kind of think of it as all as one place today. But actually, the district had more than one little town. There was Federal City, but there was also little other little towns in there. Uh, and it was mostly just farm country. Uh, even as late as the Civil War, there was still a farm sitting in between the White House and the U.S. Capitol. You know, so if you walked from Pennsylvania Avenue, you were going across a farm. Um, um, but anyway, eventually it just becomes all we just it's just one word now, Washington, D.C., right? Um, and Washington would be the one chosen to pick the site. Because, again, they both liked Washington. So they thought, as long as it's somewhere in the south, we'll we'll, we'll let Washington be the final arbitrator. You know, they were both fine with that. Uh, but they did agree that it would sit between Maryland and Virginia, two southern slave states. Um, they would both give up a little bit of land to create this district. And it was about midway. You know, if you go from Georgia 
up through Maine, it was kind of midway point. You know, today it should, you know, if we create it today, it would be like Chicago or something, something truly in the middle. But, but at that point, that was the middle of the country. Uh, so Washington chose it. And not surprisingly, he just left Mount Vernon, got in a boat because it was he was he sat on the Potomac River at Mount Vernon. And he just kind of sailed up the river about 15 miles and went, yeah, this would be a good spot. <laughs> so it just happened to be a few miles away from Mount Vernon. Anyway, um, it's interesting that Jefferson felt so strongly that he was that he wanted this, that he gave up a major issue. And that is basically giving more power to the federal government, in this case, economic power. So this other agreement uh, becomes known as the Finances Act. Um, and this is the actual bill that created it. So Hamilton was really concerned about debt um, and, and really, really wanted you know, America to get out from under its debt. So one of the arguments was, um, you know, it's, if we have so much debt, you can't move forward. And what happened during the war is not only did the country borrow money, in particular from Holland, but we also borrowed money from France, and we also borrowed money from individuals, but also banks borrowed money, colonies, later states borrowed money, even individuals were borrowing money. So everybody's in debt. And you can't move forward because every time you make money, you're just paying off your debt. Banks are failing because of this. Farmers can't get out from under this. Uh, it'd be like you guys. Hopefully you guys are not getting a lot of student debt. I always tell students, try not to get a loan if you can help it. You know, Even if it means adding a year or two to getting through college, you do not want to graduate college thousands of dollars in debt. Uh, because you got to pay that debt the moment you get out of college. And it's really horrible interest rates. So I'm, I'm, this is just a little public service announcement. I know sometimes you got to borrow some money. Try to borrow as little as you can. Um, this is, I'm, I'm being very serious here. Anyway, um, but, but, you know, most of you probably have some debt. You car payments. You might have credit card payments. You meet, some of you might have a mortgage, in other words, a loan on your house. Plus, you know, you might have college loans. Wouldn't it be great if when you graduate college, if somebody just paid all your bills for you so you got a clean slate so you can just move forward? That's what Hamilton wanted to do. He wanted the federal government to assume all of these debts. And, and in fact, again, I know I'm dating this, but I'm recording this on uh, April 4th. Um, 2020 and we're still in the height of the pandemic and you know a lot of people are out of work right now a lot of businesses are closed down so the federal government right now is actually paying people uh, so they can they, they won't go into further debt they're actually paying businesses to stay alive that's kind of a hamilton idea you know because the argument is if once the pandemic is over we don't want everybody completely being in debt we want them working and moving forward you know it's the same basic concept um, but of course, you know, if somebody get, you know, if, if I paid all of your debts, you kind of owe me, you know, and, and so I, I kind of have power over you. So if the federal government does this from a Jefferson viewpoint, this is giving a lot of power to the federal government. And it also makes all of us sort of beholden to the federal government. Uh, and that's very much an, not a Democratic Republican thing to do. But Jefferson really wants that capital. The other thing that Hamilton wants is he really wants to be able to control the economy and move the economy forward. And he says, I can only do that if the federal government has its own bank, a national bank. And which is really something that Jefferson and his followers don't want, but he wants that capital. So he agrees to it. And it is a true compromise. And this is how democracy works. You, you, both sides give up something so they can get something. Uh, and, and this is how friendships work. This is how a marriage works. Um, and that's what we're starting to learn. So this is one of the earliest compromises. We had a couple during the Constitution, the Electoral College, the Three-Fifth Compromise, things like that. But actually the functioning of the government, this was the first major compromise. And we're going to have several uh, until we get to the Civil War. In many ways, the Civil War was a failure to compromise. So a little bit, I'm not an economic person, so I don't want to get too much into, into money matters. Um, but the National Bank, which only had a 20-year charter, um, the way Jefferson and his followers argued, uh, this is just temporary. 
<laughs> you know, we're, this is just to get us through the debt and we're going to move on. So I had a 20 year charter. And what's really weird, and, and we see this with s several things in the government, where it's kind of it's government, but it's sort of private. Um, and in fact, the National Bank had several board of directors. Some of them were chosen by the banking industry, and then a few of them were actually chosen by the president. So it was a public private entity. Um, so a very small group of people um, controlled a lot of the economy, which was very federalist. I mean, that's what federalists wanted, a few people to control everything. And so this was you know, kind of scary to uh, Democratic Republicans. Um, we have there'll be a second national bank, um, and then then we now have a third one. Uh, we've had it for over a hundred years now, and of course, but we don't call it a bank anymore. We call it the Federal Reserve, or sometimes it's just simply known as the Fed. And really, the main function of these banks partly is to give loans to businesses and states and such, but a lot of it's just to maintain the economy. You don't want the economy getting too powerful because if it rises too high, then it will crash. But you also don't want it tanking. So you just want to kind of keep it going at a steady pace. So maybe you print up more currency or you you bring you, you, you lower currency. Maybe you raise interest rates, you lower interest rates. The image I've always had is when you were a kid, you might you might have played with a balloon and you, and you play that game where you keep it in the air. Um, you know, you don't let it drop. And you learn very quickly that you don't swat the balloon because you're going to pop it. But you also don't just let it fall because then it'll fall on the ground and pop. You just kind of tap it every so often to keep the balloon in the air. And that's sort of what the National Bank does or the Fed today. It just sort of taps the economy a little bit. Raise interest rates here, lower them there, you know, just keep it on an even pace. So in 1811, the bank went away. And very quickly, uh, first off, we, we, we entered a war. But then after the war, um, we went into a major depression economic depression, our first major depression. Um, and it turned out we kind of needed a bank. So they, they brought in a second national bank that went from 1817 to 19, uh, excuse me, 1837. And Andrew Jackson got rid of that bank. And the moment he got rid of it, we had a second economic depression. And for about every 20 years, we'd have a major depression until uh, we brought in the third national bank. Turns out we kind of do need them. Hamilton was right. Not only that, but the people who benefited the most from the first national bank were mostly people in the South and mostly farmers. Even Jefferson, because he was still alive when the bank went away in 1811. Even Jefferson and Madison will later admit that they kind of needed one. So the first national bank was created by Federalists. The second national bank will be created by Democratic Republicans. So another major dividing point um, was actually France. You probably never thought how, you might be surprised how much the United States dealt with France in these first few years, because obviously uh, France is what makes us win the war, uh, the American Revolution itself. Um, you know, we, they were the country we owed millions to. They gave us a lot of our weapons, our uniforms. What's really funny is that France was, you know, nothing like England. I mean, they were a, I mean, England had a limited monarchy. We always say we broke away from the king, but really we broke away from parliament. Um, but France was a true monarchy, a total monarchy. Uh, they were the country that should have had a revolution because they were literally, people there were literally starving. They were being taxed to death. Um, and again, France as, as a country couldn't care less about the colonies or about democracy and any of that stuff. The only reason France and Spain, the only reason they helped us out was one reason. They hated England and they wanted to do anything that would hurt England. I mean, the last thing they want to do is support a bunch of people who want to get rid of a king. But... They did help us out, and a lot, thousands of French soldiers came here uh, during the 1780s. Jefferson lived in uh, France. Patrick Henry, not Patrick, Henry, excuse me. Uh, others lived in France, um, and uh, you know began to Thomas Thomas Paine. So I was trying to think of a good word. I'm, I'm getting old. <laughs> Thomas Paine, who during the Revolution wrote a, a, a pamphlet called Common Sense. He was a major, major revolutionary. 
uh, and then he went, he was actually kind of aggravated. He thought we should have gone further in our revolution. So he went over to France in the 1780s uh, and kind of and got the revolution going. Jefferson was our ambassador over there. He was getting stuff going. So in 1789, the people um, rose up and, and established a new country, a republic, which means no king. And in the first year or two, they really seemed to be quite successful. Um, you know, voting for everybody, everybody was seen as equal, no king. Um, they went a lot further than the United States. And in fact, and, and by the way, including women getting rights, uh, no slavery. Um, and a lot of people thought that France basically took our ideas and because, you know, those thousands of French soldiers that came over, you know, were like, yeah, this is you guys are doing the right thing. So they go back to France and say, let's do the same thing. And so a lot of people in America thought France did it right. France went a lot further than we did. But people like Federalists said, no, 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 they're going too far. They're, they're, they are, they're giving away everything and, and they're going to pay the price. Um, and one thing that everyone agreed with is revolutions are scary. And as I've said, uh, and any historian will tell you, revolutions almost never work. And ours, we just got very lucky on. And so revolutions can be quite spooky. But people like Jefferson were enthralled with revolutions. In fact, he always said, I don't think he meant it, but he always said that um, the tree of liberty should be fertilized with the blood of every generation. In other words, a revolution every 20 years. I don't think he really meant that. But um, so there were some people like Jefferson that loved the idea of a revolution. Um, but most people kind of recognize that they could be spooky, but it seemed that France had done it right. The Federalists were very upset over French Revolution. The other thing is, again, think about what a revolution is. Revolution is when people rise up against their government and overthrow their government. It is not good for business. It is not good for stability. And we had just created our own country with a constitution. We had just established a government. The last thing you want is your people talking about revolution. You know, it's like, um, again, uh, to go back to the analogy of a marriage, you know, you, you're maybe you're in a bad marriage and, and so you get divorced and, you know, you spend a little bit of time, maybe for a while you're, you're playing the field and you're doing things you couldn't do when you're married. And then you find somebody and you settle down and you get remarried. And at that point, you know, ideally you quit hanging out with all your single friends and you're not going out at night anymore because you want this marriage to work. You know, if you're hanging out with your crazy friends, you're, you're going to ruin this new marriage. And that was sort of us. We had this revolution and then the 1780s, we were kind of partying. And then now we have settled down with a new government. So the last thing Federalists said, the last thing we need to do is, is start mixing with a bunch of revolutionaries because that's going to ruin our country. And to be honest with it, Federalists had a bit of a point on that. Um, but uh, this further divides the parties. Democratic Republicans will accuse Federalists of really being Tories, in other words, loyalists in disguise, that they only pretended to be patriots and revolutionaries. I mean, Jefferson, whose best friend used to be John Adams, you know, at this point, they become enemies, and Jefferson accuses Adams of being a loyalist, and Adams will accuse Jefferson of being a dangerous revolutionary. Uh, so, so, again, arguing over what's happening in France starts to divide Americans up. And in fact, if you supported France, uh, if you supported the revolution in France, that made pretty much made you a Democratic Republican. And if you were anti-revolution, that made you a Federalist. It's sort of like, you know, I mean... I mean, the big issue I would argue that does that in our society is abortion. You know, I mean, this it doesn't completely work out this way, but if you're pro-choice, you tend to be one party. If you're pro-life, you tend to be another party. This was that issue. And like abortion, this was an issue that everybody argued over and nobody seemed to could agree on this. And it's funny, we can see this filter down at the, at the local level. So to give you an example, um, the 4th of July, Independence Day, 
was not a day that America celebrated until the 1790s. And of course, that's the day we declared independence and, um, you know, we wrote the declaration and all this, and we said all men are created equal, even though hardly anybody who wrote that, Jefferson and all, didn't really mean it. Well, once the declaration happened and then the war happened, basically the government was like, okay, let's, let's go talk about declarations of independence. Again, it's kind of like, you know, if you get remarried, you don't keep celebrating your divorce day. You know, you, you, you now you're, you want to celebrate your new marriage day, your anniversary. So the government wanted to celebrate Constitution Day, not celebrate this Independence Day. But regular people, especially veterans of the war, they were like, no, I fought for the Declaration. In fact, a lot of those veterans didn't like the Constitution. They thought the Constitution uh, went too far the other way. They liked ideas like all men are created equal. And in fact, you know, the term founding fathers was a term that the founding fathers came up with. Um, but regular people hated that term. They were like, no, 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 you're not founding fathers. We are all founding brothers. And so uh, they started celebrating the 4th of July as a, you know, al almost as a resistance to the government. And, and, and there's a reason why 4th of July, even today, has a little bit of kind of a dangerous element. It's still a lot of firecrackers and fireworks and people drinking and it's loud because, again, it, it used to be in the 1790s, people would get together and they would shoot their guns off and shoot cannons off and do a lot of drinking, and a lot of fighting. And, yeah, it was a raucous affair and the government did not celebrate it. In fact, uh, in 1776, we declared independence. In 1777, the Second Continental Congress, uh, we're going to have a little celebration of declaring independence. And what they were going to do was say a prayer. And then they got into an argument. What kind of prayer is it going to be? Is it going to be an Anglican prayer? Is it going to be a Baptist prayer? Uh, and then so they finally just decided to hell with it. We're just going to have a moment of silence. And then they never celebrated it ever again. Um, but it was the 1790s that regular people said, no, we are going to celebrate it. And what they're arguing, I mean, what, what we're seeing here is an argument over what is the legacy of the American Revolution? What's the take home point? You know, is it just about creating a government or is it about a deeper idea of liberty and equality, which is what we now celebrate, but that was regular people. And so what they're also arguing is what does it mean to be an American. What are our values? That's what they're arguing. And so that weird hat that was at the beginning of part one, the liberty cap, uh, this is when that comes into play. So a liberty cap was something that goes back to the Romans. So during the Roman Empire, they had slavery. And then if you were freed, they would you would wear a cap that let everybody know that you are now free. During the French Revolution, they began to wear these hats. It, it's, it, it's like a political symbol, these liberty caps. Um, and basically, you know, as a statement that they are now free from the king. They are free from the old government. So Americans started to wear these liberty caps, both as a, a symbol of solidarity with France, but also as a symbol that uh, we through, overthrew one government we can overthrow another government if we have to. It's almost like a, a silent, violent symbol. And um, it, it, the Liberty Pole, uh, which again, you see a drawing of here where, where Liberty Cap's at the top, this is also another symbol, a violent symbol. So Liberty Poles were erected throughout the early, the late 1700s and early 1800s. It, it's a tradition that's pretty much gone away today. Um, but the Liberty Pole was a symbolic example of what was called the Liberty Tree. In towns such as Boston, but not only Boston, they would often be a tree maybe in the center of town. And from that tree, people would be hung, criminals. But during the Revolution, uh, this is also where people who were loyalists were beaten up and tarred and feathered. Uh, you can see this going on here. Um, you know, it was a violent symbol. So the Liberty Tree was sort of a threat. Hey, look, if you don't listen to us, the people, we might have another revolution like what's happening in France. 
every so often nowadays there'll be a few people that will uh as a protest will do a liberty poll this is in dc you can see somebody wearing a liberty cap and there's a, a bunch of small liberty poles uh with the caps on top so again every so often you know there will be people that will kind of do this as almost like a reenacting thing but then the French Revolution does what revolutions usually do, and they turn on themselves. As one uh, historian says, revolutions tend to eat their children, meaning, you know, once you set up a pattern of I don't like the government, I'm going to overthrow the government and establish a new one. Well, guess what? Every government is going to make you mad at some point. Every government is going to do things we don't like. It doesn't mean you constantly overthrow the government. In fact, if you keep doing that, what slowly happens is either you devolve into chaos or you end up with a dictator. And in France, you ended up with both. Uh, for about a year, it was complete chaos. By, by 1800, you'll have Napoleon, a dictator, you know. Um, so during 1793, 94, um, France just devolved into complete chaos. By this point, they were on about their third government, uh, and it became known as the Reign of Terror, led by a guy named Robespierre. Uh, there was a brand new invention, an enlightenment invention known as the guillotine, which is supposed to be a nice, clean, easy way to execute people. You know, nothing like chopping people's heads off with an axe that, you know, as we know from Mary Queen of Scots doesn't always work or hanging, which is just an awful way to kill people. This is just a nice, clean and easy. Uh, it holds your head down and it cleanly cuts your head off. Of course, now we know your brain survives for several seconds and apparently it's an excruciating pain after this. So it's still pretty horrendous. Well, during this reign of terror, just in Paris alone, 40,000 people were beheaded, including the former king. Um, it was a horrible period. Um, and on the right, you see a political cartoon that is a Federalist cartoon. And it shows to them what real democracy looks like. To Federalists, they would argue there's a reason why we don't want everybody having the vote and everybody doing whatever they want because what federalists would argue is that regular people can't control their emotions and they'll always take it out on the rich and the powerful and it will just be chaos it'll be literally hell on earth so here you have a guillotine with a liberty cap at the top and it's the entire earth that is about to be guillotined uh, this was the ultimate Federalist nightmare, the Reign of Terror. Now, admittedly, the Reign of Terror did only last for a relatively short period. Uh, eventually, for, for several years, France will get its act together. And obviously, we've proven that democracy tr truly can work. But this was sort of a warning to Federalists. So during this period, uh, we, we get a couple of events to happen at the same time. Uh, one of these is the Whiskey Rebellion. This is something that normally would not be a big deal, but because of when it happened, it became a big deal. So whiskey is something that is made uh, by farmers, and it was mostly made in places like western Pennsylvania, uh, parts of Kentucky, parts of Tennessee. And so um, basically what happened was Hamilton was trying to raise money. So, so in 1791... As part of his Finances Act, uh, Hamilton establishes, gets Congress to establish some new taxes. And one of these taxes was on whiskey. Whiskey was seen as something that everybody may like, but you don't have to have it. It's not essential. Um, and again, the idea is you put a tax on whiskey and, it, you know, and people can choose to buy whiskey or not and then pay that tax. But, it's, but for these whiskey makers who were primarily in Western Tennessee, uh, Kentucky and Pennsylvania, it seemed to be a tax that unfairly targeted them. And so they were furious. And for the next couple of years, whiskey makers and other farmers would complain about this tax. And again, this gets back to this learning the language of democracy. You know, um, complaining about the government is a, nowadays is an American tradition. I mean, just look on Facebook how much, but we also know that you don't go too far. You know, you don't say, I'm going to kill the president. I'm going to bomb capital. Like, whoa, no, <laughs> let's not talk like that. Um, but at the same time, if I say I can't stand the president, 
I'm not going to get thrown in jail for that. That's freedom of speech. 1790s, we were learning how to do this. You know, the government had to learn to tolerate the fact that people may not like them. But at the same time, the people had to learn maybe not to talk violently. You know, there was a limit on both sides. And this is this event kind of illustrates this. So what started to happen is these whiskey makers and other farmers would get together sometimes on the 4th of July. I mean, we're talking maybe thousands, you know, and they would give speeches how much they hated the government. They were sick of the government. Maybe we need another revolution. And, and to some degree, they did go a little too far in some of their language. And there was a whiskey tax collector that did get beaten up at one point. So again, if this wasn't great. So what ended up happening is the word of this made it back to Philadelphia, where the government was. And they were being told that there is a rebellion happening. Basically, what's happening in France is now happening in Pennsylvania. So Washington, the president, personally led, it's the only time this has ever happened, he personally led a militia of about 12,000 people into western Pennsylvania to put this down. Of course, it turned out there wasn't actually a rebellion. It was just a bunch of people just yelling. And, and you know, they were shocked. And so obviously there was no fighting. And there was no real rebellion, but more of a fear of rebellion. But it, it does demonstrate a couple of things. It shows just how how vulnerable we were uh, to falling apart. It also showed the level of fears, the fears uh, by regular people, the power of the government, and it showed the Federalist fears of too much democracy. Um, and, and again, what we're seeing is on both sides an overreaction. But it just illustrated, you know, how much also, how much influence France was having on us and the fear of France. The other thing that happens, again, at the same time, is something known as the Genet Affair. Edmond Genet was a diplomat for France. So France, again, was our ally, even though it's been, by this point, it's been 10 years since the American Revolution, but we were still officially allies with France. We had signed an alliance in 1778. At this point, England and France are yet again at war. They literally spent the entire 1700s at war. I think literally there was maybe, maybe 10 years altogether where they were not at war. So they're at war again. And, you know, England was our main trading partner. I mean, that's who we made most of our money from. So we're trading with England like crazy during the war. France is like, no, you're not allowed to do that. You're our ally. You can't trade with them. So France was seizing our ships and taking our goods. But at the same time, England was doing the same thing. Um, and so here we are, basically this little country caught between two big bullies. And on top of that, we owed France millions. So Genet is sent over by the government to uh, negotiate some deals and to remind us that we're their ally. And so he came over. And he met with Jefferson. Jefferson was very pro-France and was like, yes, absolutely, you know. Um, but Federalists were like, no. In fact, what Adams said is that our alliance was with, with King Louis XVI. Well, guess what? They just chopped his head off. He is no longer the king of France. So because this is a new government, we don't owe this new government money and we don't owe this new government alliances anymore. Jefferson argued the opposite. He said, we got to support our brothers in arms. They helped us. We've got to help them. But both sides agreed, Jefferson and Hamilton and Adams, all agreed that we didn't have the money to help them out at this point. We just don't have the money. Well, Janae gets really angry. He doesn't really know what he's doing. So he storms into Congress one day and gives a speech. You don't do that. When you're a diplomat, you follow the, the protocols of whatever country you're in. Even Jefferson was like, this guy's an idiot. Um, fortunately for this affair, because this is starting to get pretty heated, what starts to happen is the reign of terror. And so Janae's government just simply goes away. Janae just ended up staying in America. He ended up marrying a woman from New York and ended up uh, living in upstate New York where he eventually died. Uh, so he just became an American. But the Janae affair, kind of like the Whiskey Rebellion, not only revealed just how divided we were, but it also showed 
we've got to do something. We have to take sides. We're either going to have to side with England or we're going to have to side with France. We cannot remain neutral. That's what we think we can do. We can just be neutral. We can trade with all these countries and not have a military. Uh, no, the real world is too scary and dangerous for us to just be neutral. We're going to have to pick a side. Again, think, I hope none of you were ever bullied. I was a little bit, I think, in eighth grade, but hopefully you haven't been. But if you, but imagine you're on a playground and you got two bullies and they're, and, and they're both picking on you, but they also hate each other. Um, how do you get out of this? Well, you end up buddying up with one of the bullies, and we're going to have to do that. Which one, though? So because Federalists are in charge, they, they control most of Congress, they control the Supreme Court, they're in the White House, Federalists decide, hey, look, we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to make agreement with England. I mean, England is who we make most of our money from. We're basically English. I mean, you know, we, we had nothing in common with France, but we had everything in common with England. So to be honest, Federalists were right. We should have side up with England. It made more sense. Um, so we did. So Washington sends John Jay. That's the guy pictured here. John Jay was uh, one of the original founding fathers. He he signed the Declaration. He helped negotiate the Treaty of 1783. He helped create the Constitution. And he was our first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. That's why he's dressed that way. So Washington convinced him to resign as Chief Justice, go to France, and negotiate another treaty. And so he does. And it becomes known as Jay's Treaty because of that. Um, we, I don't, I guess that's France, didn't I? Go to England and negotiate a treaty. Anyway, so it goes to England, not France. Goes to England and negotiates a treaty. And basically, they're going to, England's going to agree to quit grabbing our ships. We're going to be free trade between us. And they're also going to not take our sailors anymore like they were doing. And we negotiate a treaty. And on, ultimately, it was the right thing to do. We kind of see that historically. But um, we chose a side. So we just made a, an enemy of France because not only are they supposed to be our allies, we owe them millions. So they're furious. But so are Democratic Republicans like Jefferson. They can't believe that we're going to make an agreement with the country we just broke away from. So this is when Jefferson starts to accuse people like Jay and Adams of being... Uh, enemies to America, of, of being in league with England, and uh, really quite reckless stuff. But this really, really, really uh, divides our country into. But it also means that France is going to come after us, and we're going to see that in a moment. So what's really clear is that by the mid-1790s, I mean, we're about to have uh, an election in 1796, uh, we, you know, Washington served two terms. You know, he was reelected in 1792. He's going to step down in 1796 and we're going to elect a new president. And it's clear we are completely divided by this point. Um, I mean, we are absolutely uh, a country that is divided politically. And, 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 and again, it's exactly what Adams didn't want, the rival of two political parties. And we can see this even in the newspapers. You know, this was the media during the day. Today it's CNN and MSNBC and Fox News and, you know, NPR. Uh, back then it was newspapers. And there were two national newspapers. These were published throughout the states. The National Gazette, uh, edited by a guy named Philip Freneau. Uh, the National Gazette was a Democratic-Republican newspaper. And then the Gazette of the United States, which was edited by a guy named John Finno which was a Federalist newspaper. And it's funny because today we talk a lot about, you know, conservative Fox News and liberal MSNBC. And yeah, they tend to be a little bit biased. But to, to be honest, the actual news part of, say, CNN or Fox or in the newspapers like New York Times or Washington Post, the actual news stuff, despite what the president says, it's actually pretty straightforward. And in fact, they all really say the same thing. The part that's biased uh, today is, is the opinion guys, the, the Sean Hannity's and the Bill O'Reilly's and the Rachel Maddow's and, you know, and those people, uh, Morning Joe and all of that. But that's not really news. That's opinion. The news part, the actual news tends to be pretty good because there, there's a lot of, of uh, ethics that they follow. 
back then, they didn't have any of that. These newspapers were openly and completely biased to their parties. Um, and so the National Gazette would say nothing good about Federalists, and the Gazette of the United States would never say anything good about a Democrat or Republican. What's also interesting about these, though, is what's happening behind the scenes. So Jefferson was really close friends with Philip Freneau, and Alexander Hamilton was really close friends with John Fino of the Gazette of the United States, and they both used to supply stories under assumed names. Uh, so Jefferson would write stories about how terrible Hamilton was and then get it published in the newspaper, but under a different name. Or he would give, like he would leak info to these papers and Hamilton did the exact same thing. So they were both playing these political games while publicly, because remember, you're not supposed to have parties. You're not supposed to run for office. You're supposed to be above all of that. But behind the scenes, they were clearly playing these political games. But they never admitted to this. They would never own up that they were doing this. Even though we have letters written in Jefferson's handwriting to Philip Freneau going, please publish this. But it's interesting. Why don't they ever want to own up to this? And this is, I usually ask you guys, why, why, why are they hiding like this? And there's a couple of reasons. One is they're not supposed to do this. They're supposed to be above politics. Jefferson and Hamilton would never admit uh, that they were actually part of these parties, even though they were. And so that's number one. They, they don't want to look partisan. Just like today, no one ever goes, I'm doing this because I'm a Democrat. They always say, I'm doing this because it's the right thing to do. It's that other party that's being partisan, not me. But there's also yet another reason for hiding. Dueling. Dueling is this odd thing that, that was going on in France and England and in the United States. And it was kind of like this weird fad. It, it only lasted for about 20 years. 1780s through the early 1800s, there was this, again, this fad where mostly younger men, men in their 20s and 30s, would um, basically engage in these honor killings. Uh, there's no other way to say it, you know, and this is, you know, you've insulted my honor, I'm going to kill you. And the argument was, so older people like Washington, you know, who, who was, you know, an old man by this point, they didn't do this. Adams wasn't part of this. But people like Jefferson, although Jefferson never did a duel himself, but people like Jefferson and Hamilton, you know, these guys were part of that generation that did dueling. And the argument was, this is what keeps you honest. So let's imagine, let's say I called one of you guys out in class and I pointed at one of you and I said, this student has cheated on my exam. Uh, I've, I've just insulted you in front of everybody. It'd be one thing if I did it privately. In fact, if I caught one of you cheating, that's what I would do. I'd say, hey, come to my office. Hey, look, I know you're, you know, but I'm not going to do it publicly because that's insulting. Uh, and nowadays you could sue me and get me fired, you know, because I'm not supposed to do that. But imagine if I did it. Imagine it's 1790s and I called you out for cheating. What, or maybe I said that you stole something from me. So what you would do in the 1790s, now if you were guilty, you probably just not say anything and then everybody knows you're guilty. But let's say you're not guilty. So what you would do is you would call me out and you would say, Dr. Nelson, I did not do this. And in fact, I, I'm so convinced that I'm innocent that tomorrow at three o'clock, you and I are going to meet in the parking lot. I'm going to have my gun and let's have a duel. Now, suddenly everyone's looking at me. Now I might go, oh, come on now. We don't have to have a duel. Let's. Well, then if I don't uh, agree to the duel, then it looks like I'm lying. So now you force me into this duel. I have to defend my honor by having the duel. And so the idea is that three o'clock the next day, you and I are going to show up with our guns. We're going to stand so far apart. Uh, it, every, every duel was slightly different. What, the one thing they didn't do is, is stand back to back and then march out and then spin around and shoot that the stupid thing you could do you blow your foot off if you did that just like in the old cowboy movies no one ever actually quit drawled and shot each other because again you're going to blow your foot off when you do that that's only in the movies but what we would do is stand maybe 20 yards apart and then at a, a then somebody would give the signal and we would shoot at the same time and you know so we're both willing to die for our honor and the, ar the argument here is because everything you say you might have to defend with your life. The argument is this is going to keep you honest. That's the argument here. 
it's a dumb argument, but that's the argument. And so there's all kind of psychological games. So you, not only might you call me out and say, we're going to have a duel, but you might say, Dr. Nelson, I'm going to let you shoot first, which sounds crazy. But let's say I did shoot first and I killed you. Everyone's then going to say, well, Dr. Nelson, he shot somebody who didn't even shoot back. I, I win, but I really lose. So I don't want to do that. So it's weird. They played all these weird psychological games. The reality is hardly anybody actually dueled. It was always the threat of a duel. So what you would do is we would both have a second. So I would have somebody that would be my second and you would have somebody. And so the, the purpose of a second, another person, is that if I got sick or scared, they would stand in my place. But what the seconds really do is they get together and they work out a deal because you and I don't really want to shoot each other. And besides, it turns out I'm wrong. You didn't cheat. I'm an idiot. Uh, I don't want to admit that publicly. Uh, so the seconds will work that out. And almost always they would work out some deal so that you and I still look tough, but we actually compromise behind the scenes. I mean, it's just, it's, it's completely wacky. And again, by the, by about 1815, this went away. Although we do have a president, Andrew Jackson, that ended up, I think he was in about 12 separate duels. He actually killed some people. Um, and of course, as you guys know, we'll talk about it later, Alexander Hamilton is going to be in a duel himself and he's not going to survive. So this is one of the reasons why people like Jefferson and Hamilton um, don't want to own up to their political behavior because they don't want to get called out into a duel. Another example of the violence of this period was uh, was Congress. Congress actually had several major fights. Um, and, and in fact, it's really funny. Uh, there's a book that came out about two or three years ago that talks about how much fighting and shooting happened in Congress all the way up to the Civil War. It's really quite shocking how much violence there used to be. But in the 1790s, it was really, really violent. In 1798, this is still in Philadelphia, um, there was a huge fight of Congress. And this is the famous drawing from, I love the guy in the chair. He looks like he's like, yes, fight, fight. I love it. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Um, so the way this worked was there was a guy named Matthew Lyon. He was a Democratic Republican from Vermont. And he got into a huge argument with a guy named uh, Roger Griswold, a Federalist, from Connecticut, and they were arguing over France. So Matthew Lyon, they, they got such an argument, he just literally hit a bunch of tobacco in his mouth, and he just spit the whole wad of tobacco in the face of Roger Griswold. And for the next two weeks, Congress argued over what to do about Matthew Lyon. Do we kick him out? Do we fine him? Do we beat him up? And after two weeks, Roger Griswold was so sick of this that he walked up to Matthew Lyon. So, so in this image, uh, Roger Griswold is the guy with the club on the right. He walked up to Matthew Lyon and started clobbering him over the head with his oak walk, uh, excuse me, oak walking stick. Matthew Lyon, bleeding, uh, gets up. He grabs these giant metal tongs from the fire and he starts to clobber him back and they, they go at it. Eventually, they pull these guys apart. They all go outside, and then the entire Congress starts beating each other up. Democratic Republicans versus Federalists. And then after about an hour, they just went home, and that was it. It was over. Uh, by the way, Andrew Jackson, uh, the future president, Andrew Jackson, he, he spent one term in Congress, and it just happened to be this time. So Andrew Jackson, a future president, was part of this big fist fight, this big street brawl. Uh, there were actually a lot of these. This is the famous one, but there were a lot of these that actually happened. Uh, and again, again, we think we're politically divided today, Pfft, nothing compared to what they were back then. So in the middle of all of this, we have our first real election. And what I mean by that is that in 1788 and again in 1792, everybody knew who was going to be president. It was going to be Washington. It was no doubt. Every, but Washington now has stepped aside. Again, he decided two terms were enough. Now, he could have kept running. There was no restriction in the Constitution against a president running for re-election until 1948 because Roosevelt kept running for president and winning. Uh, but back then, um, 
There was no restriction. But Washington said two terms is enough. After two terms, you're too powerful. And pretty much every president would follow that until Roosevelt. So anyway, he decides to step down. He goes back to Mount Vernon. So we're going to have a real election. In other words, we're, we're not sure who is going to be the next president. Uh, you're not supposed to campaign. You're not supposed to give speeches, even though you do it behind the scenes. But basically, the top two candidates pretty much are John Adams, the vice president, and Thomas Jefferson, secretary of state. And it's practically a tie. Um, not quite, but almost. And Adams gets enough of the electoral votes that he becomes uh, president. Jefferson gets just in a 71-68. I mean, it's that close. Uh, so Adams becomes president. Jefferson becomes vice president. They're two totally different parties, and they hate each other at this point. Let me go. Later, they'll go back to being friends again. In fact, I, I don't think I've had a chance to say this. I usually do this during the revolution. Uh, Jefferson and Adams were best friends during the revolution. That they worked together. They 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 really loved each other. Um, Jefferson became very close with Adams' wife, Abigail Adams, at this point. Um, in fact, there's always been rumors that maybe they were more than just friends. But they were, but anyway, Adams and Jefferson were really, really tight, best friends. Um, during the 1790s, they become complete enemies. I mean, really saying some of the worst things about each other. After they were both president, uh, they went back to being best friends again. And they spent the last 20 years of their life writing letters to each other and, and, and barely seeing each other, but constantly writing letters. And they say things like, I love you and stuff. Um, and then they actually died on the same day. Uh, Jefferson died in the morning, surrounded by his slaves. It's really kind of a sad comment on their lives. You know, Jefferson died surrounded by slaves people who he owned, while well, Adams was surrounded by his own family. I mean, you know, the, such a, Jefferson was not married by this point. His wife had died many years earlier, never remarried. His, you know, he lived his lonely life by the end of his life uh, while Adams uh, was surrounded by his warm family, you know. But Jefferson died in the morning. But the, one of the last things he said before he died was something about John Adams. Adams died that afternoon, but he didn't know Jefferson had died already because they were states apart. Um, he died, his last words were, Jefferson lives, and then he died a few minutes later. So it's weird, they both died talking about the other person, but what's really weird is when they died. They died July 4th, 1826, exactly 50 years after the Declaration of Independence, the document that they both wrote together. I mean, if this was in a movie, You'd go like, come on, that's ridiculous, but it actually happened. Anyway, I guess it, it always gives me a little goose, uh, kind of goosebumps when we don't talk about that. But anyway, at this point, they hated each other. Um, and now they're president and vice president. And, and, and again, you can see how the system doesn't really work. Eventually, uh, they're going to change how we pick president so that you have a presidential candidate and a vice presidential candidate, not this sort of, you know, the, not where the first guy gets the president, the second place person gets the vice president, because you wind up with something like this, which is not good. Anyway, John Adams becomes president. He had been vice president, and he's now president. I always feel bad for Adams. Nobody remembers him. He's not on the money. There's no statue to him. And yes, he didn't always behave well, but he was a real true believer in the country and, and really was one of the smartest people we've ever had as president. Really, his personality wasn't good for being president. He, he was too angry. He got his feelings hurt too easily. He wasn't good at politics, but he was great in Congress. He was great during the revolution. And I do think he deserves a lot more credit than he gets. There is one reason we don't like him, and you're going to see why in a couple of moments. There is one thing he did that was so bad uh, that it's, people still don't like Adams today. But I, I actually do think he, he deserves more credit than he gets. This is a painting of him, by the way, painted right after he was president. So it gives you a sense of what he would have looked like as president. He was a Federalist, even though he didn't play those games. He didn't do all that newspaper stuff. He didn't do dueling. You know, He was up front. He didn't play games behind the bat. But he was definitely a Federalist. And... To a large degree, he believed in a strong government, and this really came out of his belief in religion and human nature. Again, Adams was funny because he was both unbelievably arrogant, but also incredibly humble at the same time. And let me explain that. So Adams, again, had a major temper. 
and he was embarrassed by that. You know, he could get his feelings hurt and, and he could just pout and lash out. And he knows he shouldn't he should know better because he is so smart. You know, so basically his argument would be, I'm from Harvard. Uh, I'm a brilliant lawyer. I've done these amazing things. And even I, John Adams, can't control my emotions and, and, and my passions. How can regular people who, who haven't been trained like I have and aren't brilliant like me, how can they control their emotions? <laughs> so he believes that, that we need strong government and strong laws to basically protect ourselves from ourselves. So in a weird way, his political, and, and, and he also believes, you know, from a religious viewpoint, we're all, you know, like since Adam, we're all fallen men, we're all prone to sin. So just like we need the Ten Commandments and God to save us, we also need a strong government to save us. So because of he had a very low opinion of himself in, in, in many ways, he believed we need a strong government. So that's why he feels very, you know, it's a very pessimistic view of humans, basically, if you come down to it. Well, Jefferson has this very optimistic view. We don't need much government. We can be trusted. He's saying we need a strong government because we can't be trusted, if you will. Uh, but he also very much feared France and, and what's going on there. To them, to him, that's exactly why we need a strong government, because if we don't, we're going to become France. And what ends up happening is he's a one-term president, and France dominates his term. So one of the first things he has to do is he's got to deal with France. We got Jay's treaty. Um, he knows we're, we're, we got to deal with this and we got to pay France. So one of the first actions he does is he sends some diplomats to France to try to negotiate a deal, you know, to calm France down, to get out of war. Because he, he knows that if France wasn't at war with England right now, they'd be coming after us and there wouldn't be much we could do to stop them. So he sends some diplomats to France. This becomes known as the XYZ affair. So these diplomats, the first people they meet are secretaries working for the guy you see here. This guy here is Charles Talleyrand. Charles Talleyrand was the foreign secretary, basically the secretary of state for France. Talleyrand's a fascinating person. Um, he began his career as a priest, a Catholic priest, although he wasn't very religious. In fact, he had a lot of illegitimate children. He got rich when he was a priest. He had a lot of lovers. Um, it was all about power. During the French Revolution, which got rid of the church for a while, he became a revolutionary. Then when the reign of terror happened, Charles Talleyrand got out of there. He actually came to the U.S. and lived here for a couple of years. Then he went back to France when things calmed down. He became part of this government. And to jump ahead, he ended up helping Napoleon. But then when Napoleon got too out of hand, he helped to overthrow Napoleon. So what Ta Talleyrand really is, is like a chameleon. He doesn't really have any real beliefs. He doesn't have any real passions other than himself. Whatever's good for Talleyrand is all he cares about. How do I stay rich and stay in power? So he's constantly changing his beliefs to match uh, the time period. He's the classical corrupt politician. He, I mean, he is basically the kind of person that we rebelled against. So he is kind of the ultimate boogeyman for Americans. You know, he is true corruption, right? So anyway, our diplomats, and we're kind of this, this innocent country that thinks everybody is, is, is honorable and stuff, right? So these wide-eyed diplomats show up in France and they first encounter the secretaries, the people who work for Talleyrand. And what they say is, they say, and we don't know their names. They're only known as X, Y, and Z. This is why it's called this. So these secretaries say to our diplomats, they say, okay, uh, what Talleyrand wants is he wants you to right now pay 22 million to France. And right this moment, go ahead and give us $50,000 as a bribe. And if you don't do this, uh, we're going to go to war with you. And the diplomats just literally can't believe it because this is blatant corruption. This is not even hiding it. I mean, you know, we got mad over the Tea Act, which was really, really tiny, minor corruption. And we went to war over that. This is like just as ugly as it gets. And they couldn't believe it. And they were like, no, of course not. We can't just do that. 
So the next day, Talleyrand shows up and he starts to yell at these American diplomats. And he basically just says, what's wrong with you? What are you kids? This is how the world works. Give me my money. This is how we do things in the real world. What's really funny is that Talleyrand is insulting us for being sort of dumb children. But the reality was that the American way of doing things really was the new way of doing things. You know, we today, 2020, it's, you know, we love to talk about how corrupt our government is, but really it's not that corrupt. It really isn't. Um, and whenever we do find corruption, we, we weed it out very quickly. You know, um, go to some other countries and you can see real corruption. And, and, and you're reminded very quickly. I mean, when a police officer pulls you over with a ticket, he doesn't go, hey, look, uh, give me 10 bucks. You don't get a ticket. And if he does do that, you're taking him to court because we don't have corruption like that here. Um, so Talleyrand is getting on to us. But what the reality was Talleyrand's way of doing things was on the way out. He was truly the dinosaur about to go extinct. He just didn't know it yet. So he starts yelling at us and he says, look, you are allies with us. You owe us money and you just made a deal with England. Buddy, you better give me some money. We're going to go to war otherwise. And he also says, you better not tell anybody that I'm asking for a bribe. He says, I know you guys are a bunch of federalists. I spent time in America. I know that a lot of the country hates you guys. I'm going to make sure that the next election, 1800, I'm going to make sure that Democratic Republicans win that election. And he says, I got spies living in America. He was lying, by the way. He did not have spies here. But he says, I got spies there, and they're going to overthrow the next election. And, um, and he says, now get out of here. So the diplomats go back home. The first thing they do is tell everybody what just happened. Adams, Jefferson, Jefferson can't believe it. He had been friends with Talleyrand, so he doesn't believe it at first, but it's true, you know. So we don't pay them. And uh, Talleyrand, he was lying about the spies, but he wasn't lying about war. And basically we end up going to war with France unofficially. It's known as the quasi war, sometimes known as the pseudo war. So the reality is France is at war with England. So they don't, they don't really have time to go after us. But every so often, they, they just sort of throw a punch our way or they take one of our ships. Um, by this point, in fact, this really happened under Washington, but, but then developed even more into Adams. By this point, we realize we have to have the military. Because again, after the revolution, we didn't have a military. We just had some local militias. By the 1790s, the, the realization is you can't live in this world without a military. So we develop a navy which is exactly what Democratic Republicans didn't want, although they eventually support it, we develop a Navy and we develop a national army. This, this is really when, today, you know, my dad was a Marine, a lot of you might come from military families, you know, they always claim 1775 and 76 as their birth date. But the reality is, um, it's really the 1790s that, that the modern military is born. So, you know, and this, baby military is kind of fighting this war with France. And we're going to be in big trouble if France ever truly focuses on us. Luckily, they're fighting England most of this time. At the same time, because of that threat by Talleyrand that he's got, that he's got spies here, Adams reacts and he creates something known as the Alien and Sedition Acts. Alien refers to immigrants, Sedition is, it's basically to undermine a government. So an example of sedition would be, imagine if every day in class, I stood up and said, ABAC is a terrible college. You shouldn't go here. You should go somewhere else. It's a ridiculous school. Um, it, you know, they, especially at Bainbridge, oh my God. I mean, there's nobody here. They don't do anything. Yet you pay all this money. You pay parking lot fees and yet no one's ever in the parking lot. You, you pay student activity fees and yet we don't do anything for students. I'm recording this, aren't I? <laughs> because some of that, what I just said, you know, some of you might go, yeah, you're right about that. But imagine if I constantly, so maybe I should have just said all that on tape. Uh, <laughs> but imagine if I said that every single day. I'm not necessarily directly 
of attacking the college, I'm undermining the college. I'm con that's what means sedition, right? That's what they mean, you know, constantly making people feel like, um, you know, I mean, we see this on social media. This is what Russia was accused of doing during 2016, was constantly putting things on Facebook to, to just constantly undermine the election and undermine the government. That's what Adams was afraid of. So he wrote four laws to, if you will, get rid of this. And they're known as the Alien and Sedition Acts. These, and today we recognize these as a major overreaction. This is why Adams is not liked by many people today. Um, so there were four laws. Uh, the first law was, a, was what was known about naturalization. Naturalization is how does an immigrant, who you know somebody who was not born here, come here? How do they become a citizen? That be, that's known as naturalization. The Constitution has a little bit in there about that, you know, and it basically said five years, which is what it is today. You stay here five years, you take a test, you go through a process, you can become a citizen. They extended it to 14 years, which seems like such a random number. But again, this is 1798. So if you do the math, you know, you had the election of 1800 and then you had the election of 1804, 1808, and then 1812, that was 14 years later. So the idea was if there's an immigrant who is here in America from France and they're trying to become a citizen so that they can then turn around and vote and ruin the election, this will prevent them from doing that at least until the election of 1812. That's the argument. That's why it's, that's why it's 14 years. Um, the idea is, like I said, there really weren't people doing that, but, but Adams thought there were. So that's why that's there. Then you have two acts that's about immigration. One is the Alien Friends Act and one is the Alien Enemies Act. So basically it says that the president can kick out any immigrant, whether they're from a friend of ours like England or from an enemy of ours like France. But we can, if we just think, we don't even have to have evidence. If we just think these immigrants are doing something bad, we can just kick them out. You know, and again, it's an overreaction. And we were a young country. Half of our population was practically immigrants. We needed immigrants here. Um, so this was seen as this major overreaction. And then the, the last law is really the big one, the Sedition Act. Um, it basically says, it, it, in essence, it basically says that criticizing the government could be seen as sedition, and therefore you can be prosecuted, which already... Um, that's a huge violation of the First Amendment, but it's also, you know, freedom of speech, but it's also a, 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 a violation of freedom of the press because, you know, just say, sitting in your home saying something to the government, who cares? It's when you write it in a newspaper that it becomes sedition, right? So the, the problem with sedition, especially back then, is that, well, who decides what's sedition? I could say, I don't like Trump, and you'd be, you know, and half of you would be like, me neither. The other half of you be like, screw you, that's sedition. It's, it's all subjective, right? So th there's, there's a lot of problems here. But the, the real problem is it's the Federalists that put this in action. They're in charge. Only 14 people were convicted under this. That's not that many. But all 14 were Democratic Republicans. So not only is the law itself unconstitutional, but then the way it was enacted, the way it was enforced was even more corrupt. So in other words, if you're a Federalist and you complain, well, you're just telling the truth. But if you're a Democrat Republican, you're a damn liar, right? I mean, that's the argument here. So there's a lot of problems here. This is why Adams is an owner money. This is why there's not an Adams Memorial in Washington, D.C. And it is bad. Uh, you know, I, I get angry even talking about it now, you know, but at the same time, it was a, a, a law about a very specific threat. And I do think Adams redeems himself at the end, and you'll see it in just a couple of moments. But still, this even today, I bet most of you are like, yeah, this kind of sucks. And there is a reaction to it. Two reactions, the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, two different resolutions by the state of Virginia and the new state of Kentucky. The resolution is just basically where a Congress or a legislature just makes a statement, a resolution. Here it's resolved that we blah, blah, blah. And so both of these resolutions criticized the uh, Alien Sedition Act. 
What's really interesting, so you have two, I mean, this is, again, this is like the Stamp Act. This is like 1760s when colonies began to speak out against the British government. So this is, again, this could be, some people saw this as, is this the beginning of a new revolution? What's really interesting, though, is who wrote them. They were pretty much written by Jefferson with some help by Madison. Again, Jefferson is the vice president of the United States, and he is secretly writing statements encouraging people to disobey these laws. And Jefferson always denied it, but there it is <laughs> in Jefferson's handwriting, uh, one of the resolutions. And um, so he's criticizing these, these laws, but Jefferson also comes up with an idea. We don't think he really meant this, but it becomes important later in this class. And this is the idea of nullification. So what Jefferson says, is that you know when a law passes Congress, a state should have the right to nullify a law, mean, meaning basically get rid of it. So here, here's what Jefferson argues. Let's imagine that Congress passes a law that Georgia doesn't like. Georgia should have the right to get together uh, and have an election in Georgia, and they can vote whether or not to nullify that law. And if they vote to do it, then Georgia doesn't have to obey that law. You can't have that and have a functioning government. That'd be like, uh, you take a test with me, I give you a C, then you could just choose to make it an A. Well, yeah, that sounds great, but then what's the point of having a test? What's the point of grades? What's the point of any of this? I mean, it, again, if a state could just choose, pick and choose which laws it obeys, then, then there's no government. And Jefferson knows this, really. He just doesn't like this law and he doesn't like Federalists. He never, ever, ever brings this up again. Although later in the 1830s, it does come back, and we'll get to that later. But it, it, to me, it, it's like there are, it's like playing a game of basketball and then changing the rules halfway through the game. So let's say we're playing a game of 21. So, you know, one of us has to make enough baskets to get to 21. And then I'm losing. So halfway through the game, you, know, you have 20, I have two. And so uh, I say, time out, time out. I call that every time I make a basket, it counts as 21 points. Okay, let's keep playing. You can't do that. You're playing the game. And, you know, we the game was set. We had a constitution. Every state gets a say in the law because every state gets to vote on a bill. And sometimes, because we're a democracy, sometimes you win an election and sometimes you lose. That's the way it works. You can't change the rules halfway through the game, which is what Jefferson is doing here. Um, you, anyway, nobody agreed with this, and although it still comes up today, actually a couple of years ago, Texas tried to nullify, I think, Obamacare, you know, um, anyway, and I think there was something even recently somebody tried, somebody tried to nullify the election, you know, just wacky stuff, but, um, uh, you know, what Jefferson was really trying to do is he was trying to inspire action. He wanted people to, maybe not a revolution, but he wanted people to rise up against the Federalists. And people were mad at the Alien and Sedition Acts, but not enough to do anything about it. You know, again, think about today. There's things that happen in the government that we don't like, and, you know, we complain about them, we go on Facebook, but we're not marching in the streets over it. We got a life to live. And that was sort of back then. People didn't like the Alien and Sedition Act, but the reality was, Again, only 14 people were convicted of it. It didn't affect people's daily lives. They complained about it, but they moved on. And so had people risen up, Jefferson probably would have taken credit for it, but they didn't, um, and he moved on. But it does reveal, again, not just how much France's influence in us, but how divided we really were. And again, how precarious it was. I mean, again, this is the kind of actions of a government that's about to fall apart. Um, it really, this is why we call this the crisis of the 1790s. Finally, Adams realizes he's got to do something, you know, because France is, is really is hurting us. And the moment they're done with the war with England, they could take us over. He realizes something has to be done. He knows Democrat Republicans hate him. He can't do anything about that. But he does something that makes Federalists also hate him. It's called the Convention of 1800. Convention comes from the word covenant. It just means an agreement. Um, so the Convention, the Agreement of 1800. And this is an election year. This is super unpopular, but he does it. And he knows that by doing this, he's going to lose the election and not get reelected. 
but he does it anyway. He could have waited to 1801, 1802 until he got reelected, but he doesn't do that because he knows this is the right thing to do. This is why I think Adams redeems himself. John Kennedy, uh, before he was president, wrote a book called Profile. He, actually, he didn't write it. Somebody wrote it for him. But anyway, he wrote a book called Profiles of Courage. He, wrote, he won a Pulitzer Prize for it. And what, what he did in this book is he looked at when people did something truly courageous. You know, it's easy to do something that everybody agrees is good to do. That's easy. It's hard to do the right thing when everybody thinks it's not the right thing, but you know it is. That's hard, especially for politicians. Um, Adams knows this is the right thing to do. Nobody wants him to do it. He's not going to get reelected, and he does it anyway. So few politicians do this. This is He was chapter one of that book. Anyway, so what he did, I mean, it's a very simple thing. Basically, he met with France and they basically agreed, yes, there's no alliance. <laughs> it's time to break up uh, and that we would work out a deal to pay off our bills eventually and that we would quit fighting each other. I mean, it's a very simple thing. For, Democrat Republicans didn't trust any of this. Um, and Federalists now thought, what are you doing? You're, you're making a deal with the enemy? No, we keep fighting. You know, So he makes everybody mad. And again, he loses the election in 1800, but it was the right thing to do. It brings an end to Adams's presidency. It's 1800. It's also the end of the 1790s. But as you'll see in the next lecture, um, it's also the end of the crisis. You know, after the election of 1800, everything changes. Things calm down. Uh, in fact, Federalists completely go away. We start to settle in to this marriage, if you will. Again, we start out with a rough couple of years, not knowing how to behave with each other. But by about 1800, we start figuring out and we start moving forward. And with that, it's time to move forward. And let's let's end this lecture finally. And we'll move on next time to the Jeffersonian period. OK, thanks, guys.